Yeah. All right. Hey, guys. I hope you're having a wonderful Wednesday. And today, as you all know, we're talking about horny toads, which for most of us, at least us that kind of grew up, you know, in the central and the south, um, horny toads were a big deal. It was a big part of our childhood. We used to catch them. We used to kind of mess with them and see what they would do. We would pet them and love on them. Um, and so um, we're really excited to have an expert here today on horned lizards. So really quick, as you guys are coming in, I'm going to introduce Ashley in just a second. But as you guys are coming in, if you don't mind um, sending us a, a, a quick comment, let us know where you're at and if you enjoyed catching horned lizards when you were a kid. Because that's what we're going to be talking about today is what makes horned lizards so amazing. So yay, we have a person, we have someone in, they're commenting. Um, I'm going to check you guys on my phone because on my phone I can see who's commenting um, versus on here I can't. So just FYI, I'm going to be checking in there. But I'm going to go ahead and introduce you guys to Ashley. So this is Ashley Mertz and she is a biologist and a mom of two young kids. And for her master's degree, she actually studied the horned lizards, which honestly, it sounds like an amazing experience, right? What a great way to spend two to three years is studying these amazing creatures. And so she went to, for her master's, she was at Fort Hayes State University, which is in Kansas. But what's pretty cool is she did her research down along the coast of Texas. So she might go into a little bit of what she did down there at Port Aransas and um, maybe the specific species that she studied, but I know that she's going to be talking about horned lizards generally. All right, so we've got some comments in here. We have someone from Teharis. They love horned lizards too. Another person says we love horned lizards. Teresa, of course. Um, she's one of our nature coaches. She's tuning in from Albuquerque. She loves reptiles. Um, and then we have someone from the Texas Panhandle, Love Horny Toads. It's where I grew up. I need to find the video online so I can see the names of who's commenting. So, um, Ashley, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me geek out and talk a little bit more about this awesome species because, you guys, I might be a little bit biased, but they are just super cool with awesome, awesome adaptations. So I'm going to be talking really fast just because there's so many things, so many cool things to talk about with these guys. Um, if you have a question, get it in though, because I will gladly stop and answer them. And you might see my little man stop in too, Adrian. He is a reptile insect biology fan as well. All right, sit right down, please. So you guys will probably hear me call them horny toads, not just horn lizards. And I'm going to give you some credence to that term because the species name is actually Phrenosoma. And when you break that word down, Phrenos means toad and Soma means body. They are not toads. Don't be confused. They are definitely lizards, but they do have a very large body for a lizard. They're very awkward and cumbersome and, you know, just not something that you would think of when you think of a reptile. Um, but they have acquired some really unique adaptations to fit within the niche that they were given in the environment or that was unoccupied at the time that they started to evolve, which leads to some really awesome, con a really awesome convergent evolution pattern with the thorny devil in Australia. So horny toads, I guess, yeah, on this side of the screen, I should say, horny toads are a North American species, whereas the thorny devil is an old world species found in Australia. Um, they occupy a similar niche. And so the environmental pressures that were put on them allowed for some analogous adaptations that you'll see, obviously, with their appearance, appearance but also with their diet and with behaviors which is just wild. So let's start talking a little bit more about some of these adaptations and how you can find them according to either their adaptations or geography, species, seasonal patterns, etc. So this is gonna vary a little bit among species and geographically, 
but generally speaking, they're going to come out in mid to late spring and they're going to have a longer um, daily activity pattern. Um, they're just going to be more active then. And then once it gets to the later part of the summer, you're going to start seeing them behave more crepuscularly, meaning they're either active in the morning or in the evening and not so much during the heat of the day, kind of like me. And then around September, October, even sometimes into November, um, they're going to start hibernating and we won't see them again until the spring. So, um, Ashley, I have a quick question for you and you may yeah. cover this. So if you do, just tell me to wait. Sure. Um, but we saw one and I'm pretty sure it was a short horns, um, um, horny toad. But I mean, it was still very much a baby and we caught it maybe two weeks ago. So it was late September. Oh, wow. Is that typical or is that kind of a little bit odd? It felt odd to see one that young that late, but I'm not sure. Kind of. I mean, I guess they're a pretty small species to begin with. But if you're saying it was smaller than that, um, I mean kind of atypical. I don't, I don't know so much about the shorthorn lizard. That'd be interesting to look up more. And it probably depends on the elevation that you were at as well. Right. So. Yeah. We, we don't get too terribly cold in the winter, so that probably plays a role. Yeah. Um, so going into their daily patterns, uh, they are diurnal, which you obviously found it during the day. They're active during the day, not at night. Um, in the morning, if they do burrow, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to stick their head out of the ground and they're going to start shunting all of the blood to their head so that their head can warm up really quickly. And then they'll obviously circulate the that warm blood through the rest of their body so that as soon as they leave that burrow, they're ready to go. They're ready to eat. They're ready to mate. They're ready to avoid predators. They just have to be ready to go because they are so awkward and cumbersome. So that's one strategy that they use. Um, then during the middle of the day, they're going to start playing this game of sun versus shade or dark substrate and hard substrate versus, you know, something that's going to shade them a little bit more or be more cool. And we're going to get into those thermoregulatory properties a little bit later. And then at night, most of the time, they're going to burrow. However, you know, if they've got good cryptic coloration and the substrate isn't good for burrowing. They will either sit by rocks and just rely on that. And some of them have even climbed into shrubs and bushes and just slept there for the night to, to avoid like snakes and, you know, ground predators. And that is one of them that's burrowed. You can just barely see its lateral line there in the ground, which is pretty cool. Like you just yeah. can't see them. Thermoregulation. It's super important. We're going to get a, a little bit more into the biology of these guys now. Thermoregulation is just regulating your temperature. And because they're an ectotherm, ecto meaning external and therm meaning temperature, they rely on the environment to regulate their body temperature as opposed to birds and mammals who um, regulate their temperature internally through metabolic processes. So um, you'll see them um, like the larger picture over here, this guy, he was up in a tree and he was not doing a balancing act physically, but kind of biologically as well. He was using a lot of things. So you can see his, um, the white dorsal lateral line right here, which is mimicking the, um, the grass that he's in. But what he's also doing is he's kind of in the shade. He's putting himself more parallel with the sun's rays as opposed to perpendicular, which would allow him to, you know, heat up. So when you're parallel, you're not getting as much radiant energy. Plus, when I approached him, he had his mouth open. So he was using evaporative cooling to cool himself as well. But the craziest thermoregulatory adaptation, I think by far, is the use of melanophores and iridophores. And melanophores are pigmented cells on the skin's surface. And they have um, a pigmented granule within the cell. And so if a horn lizard is cold and needs to warm up quickly, those granules can move to the surface of that cell, turning them to a darker color seen here below. 
and this happens quickly. It's not something that takes hours. It can, you know, be within seconds, minutes. And then if it needs to cool or if it needs to maintain its, um, its body temperature, those granules subside down into those cells and the iridophores start reflecting back more light so they can maintain that stable temperature. So I have a question for you. These two yeah. pictures, did you cause a temperature change? Like, were you the one that caused it? Did you see this? So I did not. This was, okay. I did not, I couldn't go through my thousands of photos of horn lizards. <laughs> That's okay. I get it. <laughs> But I did find an example in a book by Wade Sherbrook. So, to, uh, you know, credit to him. This is the same horn lizard. And this was taken just minutes apart. So it happens and it can happen. It can be stress induced, which is what I saw a lot um, with the Texas horn lizard is, um, you know, it's caused by a hormone. A hormone is released in those cells um, then respond to that with the pigmentation. But a lot of times it's stimulated by, you know, a need for a temperature change, which is just wild to me. And can you, do you know of any other animals that have those types of cells to give us kind of a reference point? Do we, do we know of other animals that do that? Um, I know like octopus change colors, but I don't know if they right. use the same types of cells, right. the same mechanism. Can I ask the audience? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't either. No, that's okay. I just figured I'd ask. Oh, um, so one person just commented, my six-year-old daughter's eyes got really big when she saw that they can change color to warm up. Um, that is something that I didn't know. And I think that's absolutely amazing. I mean, these guys have so many adaptations, but they have things that we don't even like, unless you're an expert in this field, like you don't even think about. I'm loving this. Keep going, Ashley. This is great. <laughs> Good. So once horn lizards have, you know, their temperature pretty much stable, then they can start focusing on acquiring energy. And that means just eating. And these guys have a very specialized diet of ants. Um, there's some species that broaden the spectrum a little bit to other arthropods like beetles, grasshoppers, um, et cetera. But for the most part, they are very specialized on ants. And um, it's kind of cool if you think of their anatomy and the eyes are on the side of their head. So if you go up to an ant mound and you see a horn lizard sitting there and you start seeing him bobbing his head, he's probably pretty hungry because what he's doing is with that one eye, He's gauging how far away those ants are so that he can start eating. They don't have the bifocal depth perception that we do. So they're going to use one eye to do that is awesome. And so the moving up and down helps them to kind of gauge where those things, where their prey is. Think of the triangle. He's got two different eyes by bobbing up and down and then he can gauge the distance. Math. So impressive. Awesome. Yes. Um, yeah. And then if you guys think of ants, and I know some of you are going through the Nature Academy about insects now, so you have probably learned or will learn that ants are related and in the same order as bees and wasps. When we think of bees and wasps, we think of stingers and stinging and ouch, it hurts. And ants have the same mechanism. They use formic acid and they do have stingers. Well, when a horn lizard eats an ant, it could be stung. It could, I mean, they're eating a toxic ant or a venomous animal. Um, and so they have evolved this adaptation to swallow an ant whole. And as soon as it passes through the pharynx, it surrounds it in mucus, which doesn't allow the ant to sting any part of <laughs> the, the tract <laughs> of the horn lizard. And unfortunately for the ant, it dies in the digestive juices, which I mean, I guess that happens. It's sad, but it's an ant and it's food. So pretty wild adaptation. And then they can detoxify that, um, that ant and prey. And it takes about two days before it comes out the other end. Voila. Um, who knew? Who knew they could encapsulate their their prey to keep it from stinging them from the inside? Because that would be, uh, you know, I never thought about that. I never thought about the ant stinging the horn lizard from the inside, but it makes sense. 
Um, and they have an adaptation for that, which is just amazing. Yeah, really wild. Yeah. And so now, <laughs> since we've got a stable body temperature and food, we need to start talking about water conservation, which a lot of these are very arid adapted um, animals. And so water conservation is very, very important. And a lot of times the simplest thing to do is just to burrow underground because then you lose um, all of that evaporative water loss um, just by being under the ground, which I'm gonna insert a little side note there. How do you breathe underground? Like I just imagine getting a ton of sand up my nose and they actually don't breathe moving the top of their body. They breathe moving the bottom of their body. So if you stick your hand under a bot uh, in a sandbox or something, if you move the top, you know, the sand is going to move all over you and around you and in between your fingers. But if you just are able to move the bottom, there's no sand moving on the top or to come in. Plus they have little flaps on their nose that can close into a little semicircular area and it doesn't even come in. Plus their anatomy, their nasal cavities are shaped in like, uh, think of a plumber's siphon where it curves up and then back and mm -hmm. down. So it's trapped. There's no <laughs> dust getting into the respiratory system. Oh my gosh. Three Wait. mechanisms, three mechanisms to keep the dirt out. That's impressive. I think I need at least one of those. <laughs> <laughs> All for water conservation, you guys. Yes. Well, that was cool and wild, but rain harvesting is super cool. It uses um, the scales on their skin as a little channel for water to move down into the corners of their mouth. So if, for instance, they pop their head out in the morning and there's dew on the grass, those channels will move to the mouth through capillary action. It uses the adhesive properties of water to just trickle into its mouth. And when there's a rain event, the horn lizard will arch its body so that more water will follow those channels and go into their mouth and they can get water. Awesome. Great adaptations. Most of their water is consumed through the food that they eat though. So pretty awesome. Now we get to probably my, the coolest part, my favorite part is the defensive strategies because these guys are going to use three main strategies. They want to be unseen, unseen, they want to remain uncatchable, and if they have to, they just want to appear dangerous. Um, the cool thing is, though, they can adapt these strategies to the predator that is actually attacking them, which is just wild. So most of the time, they're just going to remain motionless and rely on their um, disruptive coloration, their camouflage. They just want to not be seen. A lot of times you'll see them running and then stopping. And then again, re rely on that cryptic coloration. Um, some of uh, the species, they don't have fringe scales. Um, and some of them do. And fringe scales are just kind of the, um, this guy actually doesn't have them. Um, but they're the scales that line the side of the body. And it just disrupts that shadow so that, you know, our eyes really focus on patterns and things that are solid. And that just disrupts that. Plus, like I said earlier, some of them have that dorsal stripe that either mimics a shadow or it mimics, um, vegetation, like standing vegetation, which is pretty cool. That's the boring adaptation. These are the more cool ones. <laughs> so they can, they will flatten their bodies. A lot of times if they see birds flying overhead or a huge human looming over them, they will flatten their body. And I think Dr. Jenny, you said that you do examples of this, where if you take your hand outside and you you know, kind of cup it, it makes a larger shadow. But if you flatten it, then the shadow is virtually gone. So they've eliminated their shadow. They've made just a smaller um, footprint for themselves to be visible. And then this is another really common one. They'll tilt themselves and make themselves look bigger, like kind of like a shield. And they have to judge 
the size of the predator that's attacking them. So a lot of times this doesn't work for juveniles and it works more often in the larger species like regal horn lizards and Texas horn lizards, where if they think that they're bigger than the leopard lizard or something else that's going to try to eat them, they're going to turn to the side and say, huh, uh, buddy, I'm too big for you, for me to fit in your mouth. You know, it's just not going to happen today. Sorry. Try again. And, um, it's effective. They do it a lot with snakes too. Um, then other times they'll inflate their body just to be too big. And I tell you what, it's like holding a balloon. It is so weird when they inflate their body, but they just puff themselves up with air and it's, really fantastic and wild. Yeah. And I want to, I want to add something to um, what Ashley was saying about the tilt and shield. So I grew up in Texas and we would see this a lot as kids. And to be honest, I always thought he was like faking being dead. And it was like this super weird pose. And it was like, Oh, don't eat me. I'm dead. It was like super, you know, dramatic. Um, but turns out that's not what they're doing, which is really cool that I learned from Ashley is that um, they're, they're making themselves look bigger and shielded, which, which, is, is really cool. Sorry, Ashley, keep going. Well, no, <laughs> you had thought the same thing that I did. Yeah, it, they have yeah. this tiny little brain and you don't think that those processes are going through their minds. Yes. <laughs> but they are, they're weighing and, you know, playing a balancing act. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that they can do is hiss and vibrate their tail and sound scary um, more than anything. And then they do have head horns. And this is really interesting because um, for the horn lizards that I interacted with, um, there were just a few times where I would, they would try to use their horns to get me. Um, most of the time they're very docile, but there was a study done and lizards with longer horns in the population tend to survive better than um, other horn lizards because the study showed that horn lizards that were eaten by um, shrikes or other small mammals had statistically shorter horns than those in the general population. So it does make a difference. It's not just a mating thing. It's not, you know, a sexual selection kind of thing. It's for survival. Um, so head horns are important. What? That's funny because we just had um, a six-year-old um, girl ask us, her her dad um, typed in for us, but she asked, why do they have horns? And so that is a defensive strategy that actually works, even though as humans, it doesn't seem that it works against us, <laughs> but it will work against other types of predators. Yeah. yeah. And I think that it that evolved it more for... Um, small mammals that attack the base of the neck of animals. And so that was an easy way for horn lizards to defend, you know, that vulnerable oh, okay. part of their body. So mm -hmm. there's a little more information there for you. Nice. Oh, that's great. And probably the defensive strategy that everybody wants to know about is the blood squirting because it's almost Halloween and it's just awesome. <laughs> So once again, the blood shunting mechanism that they use to warm the rest of their bodies can become very um, important as a defensive strategy. They will close their eyes and kind of shunt all that blood up there. And then they will shoot blood out of their eye as soon as they open it. And it can shoot up to six feet. And it's shocking and surprising when it happens. And you feel bad because it's got to be pretty stressful on the animal. but at the same time, that's just the way it is. So um, pretty crazy. I and did you say that that was for a specific type of predator oh. that kind of saved yeah. the blood for? Yes, um, that's mainly used for canids. And I guess when you're bent over and trying to grab them, it you kind of look like a fox or a coyote or a dog. But it's very unpalatable to to most canines. Their blood is unfortunate for them. For the canine but good for the horn lizard right so these guys are adapting to a changing world we talked about adaptations that they have acquired over thousands and thousands and thousands of years and right now the world is just changing so fast that um there are a lot of pesticides being used that depletes their um their food 
source. They're losing a lot of habitat, native vegetation. Their habitat is being fragmented. And so, and a lot of times when you have construction, you think about how compacted the soil comes so they can't, becomes, they can't burrow down as well. Um, it influences their thermoregulation a lot because cities and towns tend to be a lot warmer than, you know, open grasslands or even just desert areas. So a lot of things are going against horn lizards, but there are things that we can do to help. And that one of them is just promoting native vegetation within your community or around your home. Um, really support open spaces. Those are really great um, things to have and limit, you know, trails and roads if, if possible, if you have that effect, you know, in your society, in your community. Um, limit your pesticide use. That's an obvious one. And get involved with the Conservation Society if you can. Um, there's a lot of them at the state level. There's the Horn Lizard Conservation Society, which is um, most of North America. And so they're really cool. But I think what you guys want to know is what you do when you catch a horn lizard. And <laughs> the cool thing, don't be afraid to pick them up. However, pick them up, you know, by their body. Um, be as careful with them as you can. Don't drop them. Don't grab them by a horn or a leg or a tail. Just hold them. And if you stroke their belly, it kind of puts them to sleep. They just love it. I'm sure most of you guys have done that. It's probably one of the most fond memories that most of us have. Um, but the first thing I always want to know is, is it a boy or is it a girl? And to, the way you can tell on most um, of these species is that the males have a row of femoral pores on either leg. It's just going to look like a dotting of orange or black or dark brown. Um, and then they have two bulges at the base of their tail which um, it's just at, you know, that's where their cloacal opening is and um, the hemipenes are right there. Now the females, there's not much to say. It's just bare legs and it goes straight into a tail. Cloacal openings right there. Um, some species have different spottings, but for the most part, those are what you can look on and generally you're going to get a good idea. Females are also larger than males. So that's a good thing to know. Um, so actually, we just had a question come in and I figure it might fit in between the, the uh, these two topics. But um, Will is asking, do they bite? Ooh, I have only ever had one Texas horn lizard bite me. I don't know why. I thought I was being nice to it. Mm -hmm. So they can, however, they don't really have teeth. They have more like ridges in their mouth um, because obviously they're not chewing up their ants. Um, but yeah, if it bites, it doesn't really hurt. So I've never had one bite. So yeah. very, very docile creatures. If you're gonna pick up any lizard or reptile, pick up a horn lizard. Yeah. It's a good one to start with. <laughs> So I haven't talked about the reproductive strategies yet, but I've saved it for these next two slides. So here's um, my favorite, the Texas horn lizard, just because that's what I work the most with. Um, on each of these slides, you'll see a little icon of the head ornamentation or the horn ornamentation on the top of their heads. And a lot of times that's the easiest thing to look at and identify your species. So if you get nothing else, try to get the horn ornamentation on a picture, take it home and identify it later. Um, these guys do have the white dorsal stripe down the back and they are egg layers. Most horn lizards lay eggs. They're like most other reptiles. They're going to lay an egg. I guess I can't say most because I don't really Many know. do. I don't know. <laughs> Many do. Yeah. Many do. <laughs> and, um, and they are found primarily through Texas. Um, so the cent South Central um, United States and into Northern Mexico. Now the shorthorn lizard, on the other hand, he um, has a single row of fringe scales and he is viviparous. So Texas horn lizards were oviparous, ovo meaning egg, Shorthorn lizards are viviparous, vivi meaning living or alive. And so um, 
their young are given birth, I guess, technically in this situation, they have, they're kind of covered in a little clear embryonic sac, but they bust right out and they're ready to, to go right away, which is very important because geographically they are at higher elevations generally, which means they have a shorter activity season or, um, growing season if you're a botanist. Um, so, you know, it's it's important to know where you're at geographically, um, latitudinally and all of that and your altitude or elevation. So um, shorthorn lizards are the most widespread. I cannot tell you for a fact that they are still in Canada, but they were at one point, which is kind of cool. Um, and these guys avoid riparian areas. So if you're near a creek or a river, you're probably not seeing a shorthorn lizard. Why now, do they avoid riparian areas? You know, I really don't know. I don't know if it's just um, the interspecies competition because there are other species that are more riparian right. um, adapted. Um, round horn, round tail horn lizards, very common in um, in New Mexico, so a lot of you guys have probably seen them. Um, like before, they don't have the fringe scales on the side. They do lay eggs, um, but these guys, they look more like a rock. They're gonna avoid the sandy soil and go more for that rocky substrate um, and arroyos. So it just, it's something to look for. Um, you know you're gonna be looking for a different species when you're in that kind of habitat. The regal horn lizard is so cool, you guys. Look at that horn ornamentation. Like it is the king of horn lizards. I, yeah, it's crazy. But another egg layer, another large species, whereas the round tail is pretty small. Dr. Jenny, I'm sure you've had experience with. Probably, but um, I, the two that I know that I've caught a lot is the Texas horn lizards when I lived in Texas. And then here we have so many of the short horns, but yeah. I'm sure we have. I yep. just don't, it's not coming to mind right now. <laughs> yeah. So regals are just big and cool and they're probably the most, have the most specialized diet of, you know, up to 90% harvester ants, which is just crazy. They like the open um, level terrain, but they're more found in Arizona. You're going to have to go to that state to find them. And Southern Arizona, I'm not sure how far North they are anymore. I haven't heard very good things. But um, the Blaineville horn lizard used to be called the coastal horn lizard. And now that was split into three species. Um, they have a really sharp pair of occipital horns and they have darker banding across the back, which is, you know, you, when you see it, you'll notice it. Um, and they are along the California coast, which is important, all the way up to Northern California, if you can still find them. Desert horn lizards are another one, and they have very sharp um, occipital horns as well. Some banding, but very versatile. So in all of these species, you're gonna see um, variation in the population as opposed to colors, but don't let, don't forget about those melanophores and the iridophores because it's just, it's really a cool adaptation. Um, the thing with these guys is they are very desert adapted. So Great Basin area, um, Mojave Desert. So look for them there. Flat tailed horn lizard, um, very flattened tail. You can see the base of that tail is very triangular. And when you have it in hand, it's um, very flat. And they have that dark line, um, dorsal lateral line that I was talking about earlier, which is very um, unique. And then they have some, um, usually have some more spotting, darker spotting. Um, but yeah, those sharp um, occipital horns are pretty indicative of this species. However, geographically, they're found in a very small area. So please visit southwestern Arizona or southeastern California to get your hands on this species. And then the pygmy horn lizard is another um, viviparous species. Um, so it's another live birth um, species. And that's partly because it 
is a Pacific Northwest and Idaho species. So high in elevation, high in latitude, it's kind of unique. But if you're up that way, look for it. It's pretty cool. And if you're up for a challenge, find the horn lizard. And I am so glad you guys are geeking out with me through this whole talk because I love them. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, they're already interesting. I mean, they're one of the most interesting creatures because they have so many adaptations that we just commonly know about. Um, but there's been so many things that you've told us today that, I mean, I didn't even know. You know, and and I, I've looked them up and I read about them and everything else, but I have learned a ton from today. And honestly, I thought they were a lot more um, Southern. And some of those distribution maps kind of opened my eyes a little bit, especially for the shorthorn lizard. Um, I had no idea that they went so far north. Yeah. And oh, that's impressive. Yeah. You know, you just hope that they're still there because yeah. their distributions have constricted a lot. Um, those maps. Oh, I need to give credit to Wade Sher um, Sherbrook because his book saved me with all those distributions. If you guys want to know more about horn lizards, he is the man to go to. And this is the book to get because it's it tells you a lot more than I could ever tell you in what, 38 minutes. So. <laughs> All right. I can't find the horned lizard. Um, maybe someone else has, if anyone can see it, type it in. But Ashley, do you want to give us a hint? I will tell you, it's pretty close to the center. I'll start. I'm going to have to get really close to my screen here. Wait, hold on. Let me try this. Maybe that will help people a little bit. Oh my gosh. That's interesting because I see your mouse, but yeah. I still don't see it. Still don't see it. It is a juvenile, so I kind of tricked you guys. However, <laughs> that's how good they are at what they do. So, yeah, that's so impressive. So many amazing adaptations, and um, it's so here in Nature Matters Academy, we 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 try to learn about all types of nature but we really want the kids to experience nature firsthand. And so we try to talk about a lot of things that kids can handle safely. And like Ashley said, horned lizards are one of those that they are easy to catch, they're easy to handle. Um, that's probably why some species are also struggling. Um, but because they're easy to handle, you know, go and pick them up and look at them, but just be very gentle. If your kids tend to drop things, I always have kids sit on their bottoms across the board in all of my classes, if any kid is gonna handle a creature, everyone is sitting on the ground and they're holding it right above their lap. So that if for whatever reason, the animal does run off the hand, then there is not far for it to fall. Like it's literally right there, so it's not gonna get injured. So I think that's a really good strategy for letting your kids handle them while still being, um, still being safe. So yeah, do you guys have any questions? Is our Ashley is is this? Are we kind of wrapping up? Are we I open to know. questions? I, I don't have any more unless there are any questions. Um, yeah. Well, we asked all the questions as they were coming in. We what? did ask them. Uh, I feel like I just had one, and um, I'm having a hard time uh, remembering it. But oh, okay. So this is it. So one thing I. I come from the perspective of not keeping horned lizards. We keep a lot of things. We'll catch bull snakes and keep them. We'll catch tarantulas and keep them so that the kids learn more about their biology. But it's my understanding that horned lizards do not do well in captivity and they die really easily. And horned lizards already aren't doing well because of habitat loss and fragmentation and pesticides and killing their food source. Um, Ashley, do you want to expand any on that? Sure. One of the things that I didn't mention was that the pet trade decimated their populations um, early on because they are so cool. I mean, who doesn't want a horn lizard on a little string walking down? However, if you can't keep up with catching a hundred plus ants a day to feed your horn lizard, if you can't give them proper terrarium of the right size so that they can thermoregulate properly. And if you don't have the right skills to maintain a, you know, a good environment or have a permit, you probably shouldn't have a horn lizard. And there are still horn lizards trying to be sold on pet trade. It's just, it's, it's really crazy to me. Um, so just don't do it. Pick it up where it's at and try not to even move it too far. 
from that location because their home ranges aren't super huge. Um, so just pick it up, enjoy it for what it is, and then let it get back to thermoregulating eating and you know getting water for itself. All right, so we do have one question in. This one's from Amaya, who's a six-year-old girl, and she wants to know why they are round. Why are they round? That's a good question. Good question. That is a good question. <laughs> so which has more volume, a little narrow straw like this or a big plate? What can, what can you fit more food in? A little straw or a big plate? Probably a big plate. And they have big tummies so that they can hold more food because it takes a lot of little ants to give that animal enough energy to eat and mate and do what it needs to do. Can you please sit down and go out? Yeah, that is that is such a good question. I actually asked that, I think it was this past weekend, because you know, you don't really think about it. All lizards are, you know, rectangular. Yeah. Um, they're long and they're slender. Yeah. And then these little guys are round. And I, you know, it's just one of those things like, why are they so round and bulbish when all other lizards are long and slender? And it's because they need a lot of ants, and so they need that space. <laughs> Yeah. To be able to hold all that food, whereas another lizard, they're just going to eat a grasshopper and, you know, and that's it. But these guys are eating a, a, a big amount. And plus, it, that mucus sac around them, that takes up space, too. Yep. And, oh, that's great. Love it. That was a great question, Maya. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, This yeah. was a ton of fun. I learned so much. And, uh, you guys, Ashley is in this group, and I am pretty sure that she would be willing to answer any questions if you guys have them. So you can type the comment in this post. Be sure to tag her because it's hard to see comments after the fact. So be sure to tag her or tag me. And then, um, yeah, we'll try to answer those questions for you. So thank you guys for being here. I hope that you, oh, let me put this a little bit closer to my faces. I hope that you guys are having a great Wednesday. Thank you for being here. Quick reminder, Every couple of months, we do our boot camp in this group where we help parents design three months worth of nature challenges, nature activities, but that they can take up to the academic level. So as you saw with Ashley, I mean, what we talk about in this group is science and how do we learn about the science of nature and all these cool things that are happening around us. And so we get kids outside, but we want them to learn about nature. And so um, our next boot camp is next week. So join us and hopefully we'll see you guys then. All right. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Bye.